So today, on week number three, I'm going to talk to you about, last week we talked about, uh, we, we were talking about work-related stress. Today I'm going to talk to you about, according to the American Psychological Association, the number one most common stressor people experience is money-related stress. Number one stressor we feel is money-related stress. So let me start right now because I can feel it get, got tense. This this right here, what I'm going to go through, is not a giving message. So I want to be totally clear. This is not a giving message. I'm talking about stress. And when we start talking about money, they be like, well, you know, of course they're no, I, I, no other motive. No other motive. Because here's the belief. I don't believe that by nature that people aren't generous with their finances. I just don't believe they are. I just don't believe that, that people are like, no, I'm not going to give. I don't really believe that. What I believe is that people can't. And because they feel bad about not being able to, it's easier to go, no, I'm not doing that, rather than accept that I didn't put myself in a position where I can be as generous as I want to be. So I believe the best about us. I believe the best. And I'll tell you, I've got a, I've got a reputation of believing the best, and God showed me that. Because when we decided to come to Laurel, we had people tell us, you know, well, do you know what the median income is in Laurel? And in Jones County? And you know what I thought? I said... No, I really don't. Have you researched it? No, I actually haven't. Well, why haven't you? Well, all I really need to know is that I was called to go there, and whatever's there is there. I don't need to know the median income, whether I'm going to give God a yes or a no. And church, I want you to understand something, that whatever the price he asks you to pay, that doesn't determine whether you give him a yes or a no. It's a yes because he asked. And then he provides as you step out and apply godly principles. Am I hearing me yet? This makes sense. And some of us are right there with our money that, 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 that we won't even like examine going anywhere because we automatically, we give ourselves a no before God does. Church, I want to encourage you. I mean, here's my thing for this year as we start talking about stay intentional. Here's what stay intentional is. Ask God for a no before you ask God for a yes. When it comes to things in the word, ask him for a no before you start asking him for a yes. He's already given you a yes in the word. Ask him for a no. It might not be the right timing, but make sure you hear that it's not before you automatically shut down. Today, I'm encouraged. You're going to need your notes. If you have a worship guy, if you want to get one, you go get that. Or on on the app, there's message notes are there. That's going to help you today. Our foundational scripture in Luke chapter 21, starting at 34, be careful or your hearts will be weighted down with carousing, drunkenness, we know those aren't good things, and the anxieties of life. And that day will close in on you suddenly like a trap. Anybody ever had that happen? Like all of a sudden, it's just, it's just on you. And so we've been talking about stress. Like all of a sudden, it, just, it, will, it will just close in on you. And we want to talk about that we're not going to have a life that's free of stress, We want to know how to win with stress in our lives. Like, it's going to happen. It's going to be here. That's this life. You're not going to have a stress-free life. But what you do want to not have happen is have it close in on you like a trap. When we start then talking about financial stress, we end up asking ourselves, how did we get in the place of financial stress? Did you know that there are more verses in about our possessions and our money than there are about heaven and hell combined in the Bible. There are 2,500 verses and 16 parables about money and our possessions. And so why are we stressed out? Well, here's, let's go over a couple of things. We're stressed out when, number one, we're consumed with having more. We're consumed with having more. Ecclesiastes 4, 6 says, Better one handful with tranquility or peace than two handfuls with, with, uh, with a tail and, and chasing after the wind. So, you know, because it's always like if one is good, two is better. I'm guilty of that. You find a good deal, a pair of shoes, like, well, you know, one pair of the gray shoes is nice. Two has got to be better. But how do you know, like, it, it, it all of a sudden it gets to a point where it's not a great deal when you bought two of them. Because you, you paid more than you did for the one. Am I, am I hearing me yet? This making sense? Like, so, and here, you know, like we, we have that mentality. One's good, two's better. Our young people, one, one, you know, one girlfriend's good. Don't do it. Don't do it. 
One spouse is good. Let me, don't do it. That doesn't apply there, okay? One handful with peace rather than two. I remember I had, so I had a Honda Accord when I was in college. I had a Honda Accord. It was beautiful. It was this teal blue color. I could afford the payments. I mean, I, I was doing good with getting close to paying it off. But, it, but I bought it used. I was taught that, that, you know, like, hey, you know, I was taught never buy a new car. I was taught that. I was taught you buy a good brand between 30 and 60,000 miles, and that way you're really getting your, uh, your, your best value for a car. Somebody needs to write that down today uh, because I'm looking at the prices of these cars, and you, you could buy a house right now before you buy a car. And so I'm encouraging you. So, 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 anyway, so I did that. Anyway, I had the car, but, you know, it just didn't fit where I was in my life. Jimmy was single, needed to mingle. Needed to bait the hook with a better car. Don't leave me out here by myself. My, all, all my guys are there like, don't lie. Don't lie, because some of you are right now. You know, we know how we work. So I needed a new car. Even though the one I had was beautiful, I needed a new one. So I went to the toilet. I, need, I needed one, and I needed one. At that time, like, the gold package was a big deal. Like, you wanted all the emblems to be gold. I was like, well, I look good in gold. And so I remember I went, and so I had a car that was fine, it was great, and I went in, and I traded it in, my nice car, and I was wondering, I mean, they were so nice, and they were so willing to take it because it was valuable, and I didn't have a lot on it, and they were going to make money by reselling it the next day. So, of course, they were really friendly, and they took my car and took the balance of what was owed on it and put it on top of my new one and offered me 4,000 easy monthly payments. And I did it. And what was the reason? I ended up in financial trouble. In fact, I ended up having to give the car back. Oh, yeah. Oh, yeah. That's James. Sure did. Had to give it back because I was consuming more. I was beyond my means with it because it was great the first 30 days. But when that bill arrived on day 31, I was like, I hate this car. <laughs> I hate this car. I mean, encourage you. So we end up enjoying when we when we are consumed. Somebody say consumed, consumed with more. One house is good, but I need I need six more. One church is good, but I need campuses. And there's nothing wrong with campuses when you're called to it, but when you need it as a point of of, of significance, it's not the thing. Come on, anybody hearing me yet? Right. Okay, just take it short. All right, here's the second one. We end up stressed out when we want everything now. Oh, I got to have it right, right now. Uh, to my students that are, that are juniors, seniors in high school that are going to be going on to institutions of higher learning, let me tell you what's going to happen the first day you arrive. It happened to me. You'll walk on, campus smelling good, you smelling freedom. Woo! <laughs> Can't wait to get out of mom and daddy's house. You can't, you can't wait. And right along the line are the gates of hell. And what they're lined with are credit card companies that are telling you, come on in and sign up right here. You can get $600. Well, you start thinking, that's right. I'm going to need some money while I'm in school. You know, I may need some things. You know, uh, you may need, you know, and I thought the same thing. I thought, well, I'm going there. I'm going to need some things. Like, I may need some, because, you know, again, you got to bait the hook. I needed some clothes. I remember specifically thinking, I need to have some so I can go to Miller's Outpost. That was the name of a store that you would get nice. I said, I need to make sure because I'm in college, you got to have game. Jesus wouldn't want me suffering. <laughs> and so, uh, and so. Uh, go back one for me. You jumped ahead. Thank you. So you got to have everything now. And so this is where, where, you know, where you're looking at. So I remember and I, I went there and it'll be there. And so uh, and what I'm amazed at for our young people is be careful. Don't do it because here's what they're counting on. They don't mind giving you 600 to get you in bondage for three times that. They count on the fact that you're going to default or, or get extended. And so now you're not working because your job in college is to get a degree first. Oh, Father, I'm preaching way better than I'm getting amens today. Oh, that's the job, though. The job is to get out. And the second part of it, get out debt free. Oh, I'm shouting. I'm preaching so good today. It's good. Touching my whole leg. Touch my whole leg. Get out of there. 
And so, but now you've got a, you've got a, you've got a credit card bill, so now you've got to take up pizza shifts. And so take away from study time. And then we got reasons why our, our grades are not where they need to be. We've got all kinds of reasons, excuses. Let me give you the, ja- the, uh, the, the Greek word about excuses. The Greek meaning of excuses, excuses are tools of incompetence, which build monuments of nothingness. And you should strive really hard to keep your toolbox empty. Live a life free of excuses. Am I hearing me? That wasn't real Greek, that was black Greek, I guess. <laughs> it's kind of bad, okay, let me focus. So what I love, and then young people, what I love today, because we're in this era of, of homes, what I love is, and again, I've none to get, look, the Lord blesses you, that's great, but, but young people, let me go past that. H- how come you want a home right now that it took a lot of us like, like 15 and 20 years to get? But that's going to be your first one. Let me show you my first house. That's my first house. No, I'm kidding. That's not my first, but I did that because our young people were like, oh, y'all over here, y'all just exaggerating. So I wanted to exaggerate. That's actually an old restaurant near one of the homes I own, but I thought I would do that. It kind of had a good effect, like, oh, my Lord, imagine. that's not real. This is my real first house. That's my first home. Uh, it was a, a, a two-bedroom, two-bath, and this is a mobile home. This is not a trailer. Okay. <laughs> California, that's a mobile home. When it crosses the state line in Mississippi, it becomes a trailer till the end. Okay, because them taxes I paid, I paid mobile home tax. I didn't pay no trailer taxes. That was my first one, 3860 South Higuera Street. That was my first one. That tree right there, I planted that tree. I don't, I have killed everything. That's the only thing I've really planted, uh, like, like with vegetation that lived. And, and actually, that's the second one, because the first one I got died. And so they were nice enough to give me a second purple leaf plum tree. It's my favorite tree. I called him Herman. I did. I literally called him Herman. That's him. Look how big and strong he is now. And so, and, and, and this is my first home. That was my first home. And, and, and so that was my first house. Bought it by myself. I was so proud of it. Two bedrooms, two baths. That was actually, that was Samuel's room right there. Um, uh, it, just the whole thing. Can I tell you like the cool part about what happened? I remember being in that house and I was by myself and I was just so grateful and I was in it playing my music and the presence of the Lord came in that house and I was by myself just being, I'm telling you, the presence of the Lord came in that house and I just laid in the floor. I just wept like a big, big, old, big old baby and I remember I just saying, Lord, you didn't just come into my house. Oh my goodness, I remember it. I sat there like, Lord, you didn't just come into my little mobile home and come in here with me. But I'm telling you, I held Bible studies there. I had, I had Bible studies with my young people. One of the young people who used to come to Bible study there is now the new youth pastor, him and his wife, who come to my, came to my Bible study there are now the youth pastors at our church in California. I'm telling you, you're hearing me like this is what happened right here. And you don't need it all today. You don't have to get everything now. Take it in pieces. And if you're faithful over little, he'll make you ruler over much. Come on, anybody hearing me? Yeah, be, be faithful over that trailer. He'll make you ruler over much. Just, just be faithful right there. You don't need every slow down. You don't have to everything now. Here's this third one. The, the reason we in, 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 engage in self-destructive behavior. Third reason we in, in financial dress is that Americans spend, you already, $240 billion a year in gambling alone. Because you're going to hit it big, right? You're going to hit it big. And Lord, I can't wait to tie it off that. <laughs> Lord, if you just, I mean, Lord, if it's, I, Lord, I don't even need all of it. I, I, I just need 10% of that 1.6 billion. I'm not greedy, Lord. We get in self-destructive behavior. I'm telling you, I, we were, me and Nisa and I, we went to uh, Ruth's Chris uh, a couple weeks ago. Uh, we got a gift card from a realtor friend of ours, and we went to Ruth's Chris. We were there, so we got in the elevators at the Hard Rock down in Biloxi, so we were coming back to the car. A guy got on the elevator with us, real friendly guy. He's all, man, 
He said, I walked out here. He said, I ain't made nothing but the light bill tonight. <laughs> I, I was like, I mean, he was, you know, how'd y'all do? I was like, the steak was good. I, I don't know what else to tell him. I, I just don't get, but I'll tell you this, and this is what some of us like, we look at that, but there are people that are actually really good at gambling. They're really good at it. They're good at it. And they actually, like, like he was serious. Like, all I did was make the light bill tonight. And so they, and they, they have a thing. When they don't do what they get up and they leave, and they'll come back next day and they'll, you know, they'll get the water bill like this. But I'm telling you, be careful because it's a hook in it. It's a hook in it. Self-destructive behavior. Here's this fifth one. That, 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 where's the fourth? Sorry. We spend everything we have. Oh, my goodness. We everything we have. The average credit card has $16,601 in debt on it. The average credit card. And the average American has three credit cards with that much on each one. We spend everything we have living off more than 100%. Here's number five. Uh, we are unprepared for storms. Ladies and gentlemen, hear me. We all are going to have storms in our life. There are unexpected things that happen. Pipes made by humans burst in the most well-made houses. Roofs are going to need to replace. Tornadoes, come on. We know this. We know this. Uh, cars break down in the best made car. That alternator could go out. And of course, it goes out the day after the extended warranty ended. Come on, come on. So we we're unprepared for storms. Isaiah 9, verse 6 says, For unto us, and this is crazy, look at this. So this looks like a Christmas uh, uh, scripture, but it's not. Look at this. For unto us a child is born, a son is given, and the government be upon his shoulders, and he will be called. Wonderful counselor, not just at Christmas. Mighty God, not just at Christmas. Everlasting Father, not just at Christmas. Prince of Peace. All the days that Jesus is, he's that. He's the Everlasting Father, Mighty God, Everlasting Father, Prince of Peace. He's the Prince of Peace every day of our life. When we look at that, what does that Prince mean? It's this word that means Sar, which means Lord, Chief, General, the one in charge. Lord is in the scriptures 7,800 times. Savior is in the scriptures only 36. It's because we love calling him Savior, but we don't like calling him Lord. But I'll tell you, he's Lord. Like You have to understand that about him being Lord. Prince of Peace, that word is shalom then. And shalom actually means rest and tranquility, wholeness, completeness. He's the Prince of Peace. He's the Lord, the one in charge of bringing you rest and tranquility and wholeness. But you have to do it God's way. And here's why we're in financial stress. Most of our financial stress comes from ignoring God's principles. Come on, stay with me. I know, I know, I know this is the hard part of it. I know, I know. It's the hard part. It's the hard part of it. Stay with me. Stay with me, though. Stay with me. But when we really get here, because here's the thing. If, if, if you get on truth, the Lord will meet you on truth. The Lord will always, remember, remember we say, the Lord will meet you on an ugly truth before he'll ever meet you on a pretty lie. And sometimes to, for it to get better, you got to look at where you are, and it is. It's, and you can, some of you right now are feeling like, Pastor, I didn't come here to feel stressed. But you talk about money, I'm sure. Well, you, you just delay what you feel, but you feel it. Most times when you lay down at night, you feel it. But let's come into this safe place, and let's begin to talk about it. And so, and I'm mean, not going to leave you there, just talking about it, but we're going to talk about then how do we get past it. I want to give you today, here's where I'm going to end, six ways, six principles of financial peace. Okay, six principles of following God's plan. Here's this first one. It's crazy. Obedience. Obedience. And specifically where this starts is with the tithe. And here's why. It's a very simple mathematical equation. If you tithe, then you're living off of 90% and not the 100. 
And if you're disciplined enough to live off the 90, you'll never go over that. You'll stay within that. How many of you know, like, it's really hard to end up in a lot of debt if you're, if you're living off a disciplined 90? It's always less than 100. When we talk about the church budget, we really strive not to, we never, we never, like, set the church budget on increase. We strive on what came in the year before. We want to try to be 90% of what came in the year before. But most, but we never ever budget like, oh yeah, we're going to increase by 15%. We never do that. That way, when the Lord blesses us, we've got excess. We've got margin. And that'll be another one that's coming on. Malachi, the, which talks about the tithe and coming into the storehouse. He talks about return to me. He says in tithes and offerings. Here's where he talks about going and talking about the, the storehouse. And he says, test me in this. He says that, that, that there'll be a blessing. And listen, it'll, it'll be delightful in the land. And church, I'm encouraging you as a church as a whole, we tithe as a church. It's why we don't mind talking about it because that's what we do as a church. We give away at least 10% of what comes in. It's always usually more than that. We do that because there's a principle involved. That even as a church, if we live off the 90, we don't end up overextending ourselves. We really want to strive really hard to do that, to be obedient to God's plan. Here's the second one. Your second principle to walk in a financial peace is contentment. Say contentment. Contentment. The attitude of gratitude. There's nothing wrong with pursuing more, but don't pursue more because you're unhappy with what you already have. Be, 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 hey, the, be grateful. Pursue more because that's what the Lord has for you, but don't, don't pursue more because it's just never enough. Come on, can I, is that, are y'all with me yet? Can I just talk to like, as, as a pastor, like what that looks like in like, like ministry terms, like for, for this. So, you know, like, you know, you know, you know what every pastor of a church of 15 people thinks of? You just wait till I'm 50. You wait till 50 people are here. We're going to change the world. You know what a pastor of a church of 50 thinks of? You just wait till we're 100. You know what a church of 100 thinks of? 250. 250 thinks of 500. 500 thinks of 1,000. Oh, we're going to build a big old, big old building. 1,000 thinks of 5,000. And that's why if your significance does not come from completing your assignment that the Lord has given you, there will never, ever, ever be a number that satisfies that kind of heart. Now, I'm using that because... That's a lot easier to see than sometimes when we start talking about money or more. It's easy to look and see the number of people that you, when you come to hear you on a Sunday or worship together. But I want to drive that right home to where you are. Where's your more at that you're not content about or that, that you struggle with contentment? That's why you got to look and find your contentment. It comes from the Lord. That he blessed you and you do your assignment with where he has you. You're not always looking over at the fence at what somebody else has. 1 Timothy 6.10 says this, but godliness with contentment is great gain. Somebody say great gain. Great. But before we brought, well, we brought nothing into this world and we take nothing out of it. But if we have food and clothing, we will... and into many foolish and harmful desires that plunge people into ruin and destruction for the love of money, the love of it, the love of money is the root of all kinds of evil. For money have wandered from the faith and pierced themselves. Look at this, pierced themselves with many griefs. Proverbs 30 goes on to say, keep falsehood and lies far from me. Give me neither poverty nor riches, but give me my daily bread. Does that, Lord, I'm not asking you for a, a way over this. I'm not asking you to be in, in lack. Lord, give me my daily bread. Otherwise, I may have too much and disown what you say. Who is the Lord? Or, or I may become poor and steal and so dishonor the name of the Lord. The heart of that. Because I'm, I don't, hey, I, I'm not trying to be in overabundance. I'm not trying to be in lack. I just want my daily bread. And Lord, I want it because I don't ever want to get to a place where I would dishonor you. Here's this third one, margin. Somebody say margin. The space between you and your limits, margin. Space between you and your limits. Proverbs 21, 20 says, 
The wise store up choice food and olive oil, but fools gulp theirs down. Here's this other one. The key to margin is simplify. Simplify. The key to margin is to simplify. Here's this fourth one. I know, it's past the year message this year. I know, I know. It's gonna be good. Stay with me, you're gonna be good. Here's this fourth one, generosity. Say generosity. Yeah, Psalm 112, verse five. These are, here we go, things that are gonna help you. Number five, good will come to those who are generous and lend freely, who conduct their affairs with justice. Proverbs then 11, 25 says, a generous person will prosper. Whoever refreshes others will be refreshed. Here's what I wanna go today. That generosity is not an act. Generosity is a character quality. You may do something that's generous and not be a generous person. But generous people, it's in there, it's the quality, it's a character quality. And why is that? It's not just generosity with, because I'm only thinking about giving a donation. No, it's with your time, it's with your consideration. With, with, are you even generous with like sending texts to people that encourage them? When's the last time you did just generosity with your time? You're going somewhere, you, you got your, your things you want to accomplish that day, but, but someone needs help on the side of the road. When's the last time you stopped to help? Generous. It's not always about like giving money or resources. Generosity is a character quality. When's the time time you just took time and prayed and like your whole prayer time was for somebody else or something else and not you? Generosity. Here's this fifth one then, integrity. Because God is watching. Integrity, because God is watching. If you're going to win the stress test when it comes to money, you have to operate with integrity. Proverbs 20, 23 the Lord detests differing weights and dishonest scales do not please him. Integrity. 2 Corinthians 8 says, For we are taking pains to do what is right, not only in the eyes of the Lord, but also in the eyes of man. Integrity. My, before I saw it, like it illustrated the most, when I was in college, there was a basketball player, his name was Brandon. We lived in the dorms across from the parking lot. I will never forget, we came back. Of course, college students were out getting pizza at three in the morning. We have bodies that could handle that at that point in time. So we had been out and we were coming back at three and, we, and across the street from our dorm, it was a stoplight and a crosswalk. And so anyway, it was the middle of the night. So we're all just walking and we're coming back to the dorm. There's nobody there, it's three o'clock in the morning, we're on campus, so we're walking there. And so we're all walking and all of a sudden we get up to the door and we look back and Brandon's across the street, standing across the street at the crosswalk. And it's kind of like, almost like a rain man moment. Like, what's he doing over there? And then light, the thing said walk, and Brandon came walking across, and we're all sitting there like, what are you doing? You know, one, because we had to hold the door open for him, and I was like, so I remember I asked Brandon, I said, Brandon, I said, what are you doing? I said, well, why are you over there? He said, the sign said, don't walk. I said, so, there's no cars coming. Go on, let's go. You know, and he said, well, I don't just obey when people are around or when cars are coming. I obey because that's who I am. Never forgot it. Never forgot that. Integrity is not just when cars are coming or people are around. Integrity does what's right no matter what time of day it is. Maybe you're like, well, that's a little extreme. Okay, maybe it is extreme, but you know what? Integrity sometimes seems extreme. In fact, most times integrity looks like it's extreme. Like, you know what? I mean, but it also does what's right in the eyes of the Lord and in the eyes of man. And sometimes those, like, like it's, it's hard. Sometimes we do what's right in the eyes of man, but it's not right in the eyes of the Lord. You deserve that. You use it. But you know that's not what the Lord, what pleases God. And so I'm encouraging you, like, integrity, especially when it comes to your money, it's important that you do what's right in the eyes of the Lord and, and, and in the eyes of man. Do things right with integrity. I'm encouraging you. Here's number six. Here's this last one today. Dependence. That's mentioned in the scripture 20 times in scripture. And in Western culture, we value independence way too much. 
John 16, verse 4 says, Until now, you have not asked for anything in my name. Ask, and you will receive, and your joy will be complete. Pastor James, what do you mean, independent, like dependence? Like, I, 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 I'm not saying not to work. Here's what I'm saying. It's a great model for a, a, a nation, but it's not a good model for the way God intended us to act as the family of God toward one another. Here's the reality of what he wanted. He wanted us to live in a place where I need you and you need me and we need the Lord. That's the godly way. And see how it offends like our even mentality, like they think like that? I don't, I don't need anybody. Actually, yes, you do. Yes, you do. Because last time I checked, you go to Kroger like I do. I didn't harvest those vegetables. Somebody else did. Last time, listen, I go fishing. I go fishing. I love fishing. I fish at Kroger. Back aisle, seafood section. I catch something every single time I go. I have never not walked out of there catching what I wanted. Okay? Now, some people go out to these lakes and creeks. <laughs> You know, hey, have at it. We find our peace in different ways. It's okay. Hey, but, but, come on, you follow me? But I needed someone to catch that fish for me. I'm grateful. I'm grateful people to catch crabs and, and scrimps, scallops, robsters, all that. Scrawberries, yams, green onions. Cabbages, because we got to put S on everything, you know, goodness, we got to put S. Cabbages, you know, all that, you know. Okra when it's fried, not boil. I don't do that, do that. I don't really need the person to catch greens right now. I'm, I'm trying, I'm still working on that. I'm trying to get, don't quit looking at me, Pastor Ward. Don't mess with me. One day I'm coming back to greens. Right now I'm not there yet. Don't judge me. I love, that's my buddy. I'm loving, but he ain't going to look at me like messing with me about no greens. Come on, you hear me yet? Like, that, we need each other. Look, I, in my car, I, when I go to Burton's, I need Kevin. I need Kevin to figure out what is going on with that car. If you needed me to figure it out, it ain't going to happen. It ain't going to happen. I need, we need each other. Hey, I, even at our building the other day, somebody went in, somebody vandalized, went in and broke one of the windows there. You know, I'm looking and, and I'm telling you, it's, it's so cool. I sat there and I'm like, okay, now what in the world? I call, I, like, I need people. I call Blake. I was like, Blake, so I broke the window out. Can, can, you, can you look at, 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 at fixing it? I mean, yeah, I'm going to send somebody out there. You know, I drove by yesterday, and I mean, I drove by, I drove by kind of early. And that window had wood on it. And I know, I went by late that evening before, and there was no wood on that window. So sometime, like, between the hours of, like, 1 a.m. and 3 a.m., Blake went out there and, and fixed that window. Which is, if y'all know Blake, that's what he does in church. He comes here between one and three and fixes it. He changes everything. That's how it goes. And so I love him for it. But I mean, like, I, we need each other. I need him. I can't, I, we, we can't do this. I need you all. I need Jeff Gwinnett and, and Kim. I, I need you in this. Hey, Pastor James, get to stand up here in front. But uh, listen, I need you and you need me. We need God to change our whole community, change our lives. Iron sharpening iron and all it takes is something to happen in your life that's really, really difficult for you, and you really see how much you need people. I'm grateful, grateful, grateful. As my dad went home to be with the Lord, man, just seeing the level of support that came around, I'm grateful, grateful, grateful. It's hard to think that I moved here 10, 13 years ago, actually, and my mother, my grandmother, and my, and my dad, those are the only ones that I knew besides my team that came. William was my cousin. I knew, obviously knew William, my cousin, my relative. But I'll tell you, like, when you saw, like, when my dad passed and see all the, the family that came around and sent flowers and sent stuff and just sent texts, you know, I just thought, Lord, I'm a blessed, blessed man. And I need you. And you need me. And we need the Lord. And so when we start talking about then this the stress of money, I want to end with a very familiar section of scriptures. It's the last part of this about the prodigal. Because what can happen right now is people can start to feel a lot of condemnation. Because you know 
that you haven't done things well and maybe you're in the middle of something right now and you're, maybe you've been in something for years. When we start talking about money in church, it really begins and the enemy really comes in and starts to bring condemnation on you. Really starts to fold his arms and you know, you, you call yourself a believer, look at you, look at you. And he really starts to speak at you and he wants to twist what God is saying to you so that you don't hear the Lord encouraging you, saying that there's a better day. All you hear is the beat down, like, you ain't doing right. You need to get in shape up and get right. And in Jesus' name, I speak against that foul spirit to cease its operation against your ears and your heart and your life in Jesus' name. There is therefore now no condemnation to those who are in Christ Jesus even when you've made money mistakes. No condemnation. And right where you are, just everybody in the room, would you just bow your heads just for a second, right where you are. Everybody just be still just for a second. I need anybody moving right in this moment. And if you made money Errors when it comes to the Lord. Like when it really, you made some financial decisions that weren't wise, some of this stuff got a little bit close to home for you. Would you just right now, just, just tell the Lord, Father, I'm sorry, would you forgive me for mishandling, not being a good steward of what you've given me? Because we never talk about like the part that starts with it first. And the first place of getting financially whole is asking the Lord's forgiveness for not being a good steward over the things that he's given you. And let me tell you, Pastor James has had to pray that on more than one occasion. I wish I, wish I could say I didn't, but I have. But I have. And if you don't get from under that cloud of condemnation you're never going to feel worthy enough to stand up right before the Lord and ask him for help because you're going to think you don't deserve it. Here's the truth. You don't deserve it, but you're going to get it because he loves you and he has a plan for you because he knows the thoughts and plans that he has for you. Thoughts of good and not of evil to give you a future and a hope because you're his, because you're his, because you're his, because you're his. You don't have to deserve it, your family. So in Jesus' name, Jesus' name, I pray you feel the fresh wind of forgiveness and that filthy, foul stench of condemnation leave your life right now in Jesus' name. And that you would see it's a new day. Open your eyes for a second, and here's this last scripture I want to go over. It's the very familiar scripture out of Luke about the prodigal son. And here's what happened when the prodigal came home. He said, I'll set back and go to my father's house. Gabe, y'all can come on now. And father, I've sinned. Look at what the prodigal did. Father, I've sinned against heaven and against you. I am no longer worthy to be called your son. Make me like one of your hired servants. And so he got up and went to his father. Look at what happened. But while he was still a long way off, his father saw him and was filled with compassion for him. And he ran to his sons and threw his arms around him and kissed him. Somebody in this room needs to see that's exactly the way he's doing you right now. Your father in heaven is not going, it's about time. He sees you from a long way off and says, oh, my goodness. Oh, my goodness. My whole heart don't come back. I have missed you. I never stopped loving you. I know you may have done wrong, but you always have a place in my heart. And nothing will ever turn my heart away from you. Somebody today has been under the condemnation of just the whole thing with 
money and thinking like God's not even pleased. In Jesus' name today, when you ask for forgiveness, let me tell you something began to change right then. Now it's going to take discipline to continue to walk in it and to get out of where you're at. So if that's what you need, then ask the Lord for it. Ask him for it. Remember after I told you I had to give the car back. Here's the reason I gave the car back. You ready? You guys want, you ready for the reason I gave the car back? I would love to say it was because like I had this revelation. I gave the car back because I had met niece again after not seeing her for years and knew then that like I wanted to marry her. And I knew that I couldn't and I didn't want to bring her into a mess. And so I had to, I had to get it together. I had to like be something I didn't really know how to be. And usually what happened in my life when I didn't know how to do something before there was YouTube, there was this crazy thing called prayer. I couldn't YouTube how to be a man. So I had to ask the Lord to bring men in my life, godly men in my life to show me. And one of them was my pastor. This gave me the courage to make tough decisions. It was hard, hard to walk on that car lot and drop off those keys knowing that I was saying I could no longer afford it. That was a hard, hard day. But many, many years later, it was great to walk on any car lot I wanted to and know that they were, what's your credit score? It's good enough. I don't, I don't need you to look at that. I know where I'm at. What's the price for that car? I can afford it. Years later. That was a hard day to give those keys back, but it was a great day when I stood at New Life Nazarene Church on October the 7th and, and my wife came down that aisle. What I had desired right there was coming there. Like what I had needed in my life. I had a reason. I had a reason to be disciplined because I wanted to bless her. And I remember even my house, like when I really got it together, I had to look at my home. And I remember, I, I remember saying, Lord, I'm not going to lose my house. I'll trade that car, but I'm going to have a place for her to live. Now, I remember before we got married, two weeks before, I had a roommate. I had to tell my roommate, you know, you had to move. because they. And I, and I remember bringing and I remember giving her a key. And I remember her coming in. I said, what you need me to do? Two weeks for the way, what do, you, what do you want? And she picked all the colors she wanted, walls painted. I remember there was a time in my life there was nobody in my life. So I was grateful to paint walls because I had somebody in my life that was going to help me live my life. That was going to help me. Am I hearing me yet? This is making sense yet at all. I had a reason to be disciplined. I asked God to help me, and you know what he did? And you know what? Discipline's hard. Discipline's hard when you want to go out to eat and you got to go home and cook. Like, but the Lord gave me a great, someone that, that's an amazing cook, and so I didn't have to worry about it. Man, it was amazing. Now, when we first got married, she cooked for an army. I mean, she cooked for like 12 people. I, did, I was like, who are we cooking for? I was like, Lord, I mean, we come home, it'd be pots. And I'm like, me, is somebody coming over? Like, we, it was like we was black Greeks. Big fat black Greek wedding. Like, it was like we had everybody. It's lambs, it's spits, it's stuff. Everybody. I'm like, what is going on? I don't know what's going on. Let me tell you about the one time I got in trouble. I'm going to help you out. Where are my guys at? Married or not, I'm going to help you. When they come in your life, make room. Sometimes you got to sit in silence. So I came home one night, and these had candles everywhere. I didn't have a candle in my house except for emergencies when I was single. I get married, now I got scented candles. I mean, I come in, I mean, it's, it's hibiscus and, and honeydew. I mean, it's all kind of scented candles. I came home one night, it was candles everywhere. And so you would think, right? I'd be like, this is nice. I get this. I get this. Candles everywhere. It's kind of dark. Look, Lord Jesus. If I, I single came home, when one candle lit. I lit a candle, and it was I was single it was because their power was out, and I had to check to make sure I paid the bill. This power was on. I knew that. I've been disciplined. Candles everywhere. 
And so being the wise and godly man I was, I came out, looked around all these candles. My wife's there, and I look at her, see her there. What did I say out of the abundance of my heart? I said, what are we doing, channeling spirits? What are we doing around here? What's this about? Lights came on, it was over. <laughs> it was it was, lights came on, it was, that was it, the candle got blown out, set off the smoke detector, because so much smoke from the candles being blown out. It was just ruined, runt, runt that we said, my southern, runt, okay, it's okay. What's the point? Ask the Lord for the gift to shut it sometimes, okay? He blessing you, you done messed up, you done messed up laughed at because I had somebody to mess up with but it started with the discipline I had a reason that was bigger than me come on somebody hearing me yet and that's good and bad because niece niece is a great reason to get it together but how many know the Lord is an even greater reason to get it together come on anybody hearing me yet I don't want one person leaving here condemned. You are not condemned. You may be challenged. You've probably been stirred. You may have been poked. Maybe you got a paper cut or two. But it's not fatal. And it's just the Lord so gentle. Remember, we don't beat sheep. But sometimes the shepherd does tap them with the staff to get them back into the right path so they go into the gate of his safety. And here's the thing. I'm not the shepherd. He's the shepherd. And the tapping that you feel is not coming from Pastor James, it's coming from the Lord saying, okay, you asked me this year to help you. I'm helping you. I'm helping you. I'm helping you. All right, one more time. Your head's bowed, your eyes closed, and maybe you're here today. We've been talking about money, but really what we've been talking about is surrender. I don't want you to accept Jesus. I want you to surrender your life to him. If you're here today, and though we've been talking about money, you, you felt the presence of God like really like talking about a level of surrender, and it starts with a relationship with him. If you're here today, you need to surrender your life to Jesus. I'd love the opportunity to pray with you in this very safe place. There's no condemnation. But right where you are, if you need to surrender your life to Jesus, would you just lift your hand and say, Pastor James, man, it's me. Or I need to rededicate your life, surrender again, because you've just been away from the Lord. We'd love the opportunity to pray with you today. Is there anybody at all that needs to make that decision today? Thank you, God. Checking the balcony. I'm checking the main floor. Then I trust that we are all in the right place. And how many know that is good, good news today?